All right, hey there. All right, we're on chapter 12. So um, last time, um, Odd had gone back into the house after being expelled out onto the street and uh, had hid behind a door just because he had a feeling that he didn't want to go back in that room. And from the hallway then, a whole bunch of Bodaks came swarming out. So anyway, that's where we left it. So here we go, chapter 12. A group of Bodaks on the move sometimes brings to mind a pack of stalking wolves. On other occasions, they remind me of a pride of slinking cats. Pouring through the hallway arch into the living room, this particular swarm had an unnerving insectile quality. They exhibited the cautiously questing yet liquid swift progress of a colony of cockroaches. They came in roach-like numbers, too, 20, 30, 40. They quivered into the room as silent and as black as shadows, but unlike shadows, they were untethered from any entities that might have cast them. To the ill-fitted front door, to the poorly cocked living room windows, they streamed as if they were billows of soot, of soot drawn by a draft. Through crank and chink, they fled the house into the sun-drenched afternoon of Camp's End. Still, they swarmed out of the hallway, 50, 60, 70 and more. I had never before encountered so many Bodaks at one time. Although from my position in the kitchen, I couldn't see around the living room archway and down the hall. I knew where the intruders must have entered the house. They had not arisen spontaneously from among the gray dust balls and the smoldering socks under Fungus Man's unmade bed. Nor had they manifested out of a boogeyman infested closet out of a bathroom faucet from the toilet bowl. They had arrived in the house by way of the black room. They seemed eager to leave this place behind them and to explore Pico Mundo, until one of them separated from the churning swarm. It abruptly halted in the center of the living room. In the kitchen, I considered that no available cutlery, no toxic household cleanser, no weapon known to me would wound this beast that had no substance. I held my breath. The Bodak stood so hunched that its hands, if they were hands, dangled at its knees. Turning its lowered head from side to side, it scanned the carpet for the spore of its prey. No troll crouched in the darkness beneath its bridge, relishing the scent of a child's blood, had ever looked more malevolent. At the gap between jam and door, my left eye felt pinched, as though my curiosity had become the serrated jaws of a vice that held me immobile, even when it seemed wise to exit at a sprint. As others of its kind continued to roll and ripple past it, my nemesis rose from its crouch. The shoulders straightened, the head lifted, turned slowly left, then right. I regretted using peach-scented shampoo, and suddenly I could smell the meaty essence that the greasy smoke from the griddle had deposited upon my skin and hair. A short order cook just off work makes easy tracking for lions and worse. The all but featureless ink black bodak had the suggestion of a snout, but no visible nostrils, no apparent ears, and if it had eyes, I could not discern them. Yet it searched the living room for the source of whatever scent or sound had snared its attention. The creature appeared to focus on the door to the kitchen. As eyeless as Samson in Gaza, it nevertheless detected me. I had studied the story of Samson in some detail, for he was a classic example of the suffering and the dark fate that can befall those who are gifted. Standing very erect now, taller than me, the Bodak was an imposing figure in spite of its insubstantiality. Its bold poise and a quality of arrogance in the lift of its head suggested that I was to it, as the mouse is to the panther, that it had the power to strike me dead in an instant. Pent-up breath swelled in my lungs. The urge to flee became overpowering, but I remained frozen for fear that if the Bodak had not for certain seen me, then even the small movement of the swinging door would bring it at a run. Grim expectation made seconds seem like minutes, and then to my surprise the phantom slumped into a crouch once more and loped away with the others. With the suppleness of black silk ribbon, it slipped between window sash and sill into sunlight. I blew out my sour breath and sucked sweet air, watching as a final score of Bodaks spilled through the hallway arch. When these last foul spirits had departed for the Mojave heat, I returned to the living room, cautiously. At least a hundred of them had passed through this room. More likely there had been half again that many. 
In spite of all that traffic, not one page of any magazine or romance novel had been ruffled. Their passage had left no slightest impression in the nap of the carpet. At one of the front windows, I peered out of the blighted lawn and the sun-scorched street. As far as I could determine, none of the recently departed pack lingered in the neighborhood. The unnatural chill in the small house had gone the way of the boat axe. The desert day penetrated the thin walls until every surface in the living room seemed to be as radiant as the coils of an electric heater. During their passage, that tumult of purposeful shadows had left no stain on the hallway walls. No trace of the burning electrical cord smell remained either. For the third time, I stepped up to that doorway, the black room.